We're getting back to science, more or less. Hertz is the derived unit of frequency in the international system of units, defined as one cycle per second. It's named after Heinrich Hertz, the first person to prove the existence of electromagnetic waves. The current 5G network, Verizon, for example, operates at a higher millimeter wave frequency with a wider spectrum bandwidth than previous cellular technologies. The first cellular network, 1G, operated at 850 to 1900 megahertz. This is, well, about eight to 10 times higher than frequencies that you might get on the FM radio in your car, that thing that uh, nobody uses anymore. When we got to 2G and 3G phases of cellular service, we added a couple additional frequencies, 2100 megahertz, and 4G added 600 megahertz, 700 megahertz, 1.7, 2.1 gigahertz, 2.3, and 2.5 gigahertz. The reason we add these additional wavelengths is because of the nature of those wavelengths. The higher the frequency, the greater the transfer speed for data, but the quicker the signal is attenuated. So it can be stopped by walls, by a distance. These are, are negative, so you can transfer a lot of data if you can get the signal. Lower frequency bandwidths will allow information to travel a greater distance and around more obstacles, but at a much lower rate. So there's always a, a trade-off. When we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, we consider it to be the full range of electromagnetic wavelengths, from the very highest frequency wavelengths to the very lowest frequency wavelengths. Visible light, something we're all familiar with, we can, we can see it, occupies a very narrow band in the full spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. Now, it's not a coincidence, at least I don't think it's a coincidence, that about half of the insulation we receive from the sun is within this range of wavelengths right here, this narrow band. It's also the band of wavelengths that we can perceive through vertebrate eyes, through our eyesight. So we probably evolved the ability to see these wavelengths because they're the most common wavelengths available at the Earth's surface. Now, on this end of the diagram, we have wavelengths increasing. We go from infrared radiation, uh, where we can, using proper equipment, see radiation that we can also feel. Visible radiation consists of the range of wavelengths between 400 and 700 nanometers. A nanometer is about a billionth, well, precisely a billionth of a meter. The visible spectrum represents all visible wavelengths, the colors of the rainbow. Infrared radiation have wavelengths that are measured in microns or micrometers. This is one millionth of a meter. About 40% of the sun's energy is emitted at wavelengths longer than 700 nanometers, the fringe of visible light. Microwaves and radio waves are even longer than infrared radiation. These radio waves can be measured in wavelengths of meters. Ultraviolet radiation, on the other hand, has wavelengths from 400 nanometers to 10 nanometers in length. The sun emits about 10% of its energy within this band of wavelengths. At the further end of that extreme, we have X-rays, gamma rays, and cosmic rays. These have shorter wavelengths than UV radiation, uh, much shorter. And fortunately for us, they have limited effects at the Earth's surface because they interact with gases in the upper atmosphere. Those gases really prevent us from having a lot of ionizing radiation problems. And we need to think about flux. Flux is the amount of energy or the amount of a material that passes through a given area perpendicular to that area per unit time. For our purposes, we're going to consider flux to be equal to the number of photons that pass through a unit surface area per unit time. An example you may have seen if you watch college football is the throwing of footballs, the most footballs, through an opening, in this case a, a large Dr. Pepper can, in 30 seconds. So the photons are going to be footballs in this case, and the surface area is going to be the opening in the can. 30 seconds is going to be our, our time, our counting time. And if you're successful throwing the most photons or footballs through this opening, you could win a $100,000 scholarship. So it behooves you to practice if you're going to be on national television basically shooting for $100,000, maybe prepare a little. But this is a video you can take a look at in your uh, spare time to get a feel for what a flux is. Again, in this case, it's a practice to increase the number 
of footballs per 30 second interval or increase the flux of photons per 30 second interval. This brings us to the sun, the ultimate source of our radiation. When we look at the surface of the sun, taken through a special telescope, we can see a lot of details that are unavailable to us with the naked eye. And they're unavailable to us even wearing solar glasses, the kind of glasses you wear to, to watch a total eclipse. So in these images, what we see is a very active surface layer of the sun, bright spots representing hot areas of the sun's surface, darker spots representing cooler areas of the sun's surface. So energy is rising generally in these locations, the bright spots, and sinking in these locations, the darker spots. Occasionally we have these big jets of plasma bursting from the sun's surface hundreds of thousands of kilometers into space and then ultimately being drawn back in along magnetic field lines into the sun's surface. So the plasma is ejected here, very hot, streaming out hundreds of thousands of kilometers, cooling off in the corona, and then being pulled back into the sun by the gravitation and uh, magnetic field of the sun. If we take a closer look at one of these solar prominences or filaments, we can see that twisting of the plasma as it rises and cools and sinks back into the sun. So again, it's ejected here in this white or very light colored hot spot. It becomes darker and darker as it passes through the corona, cooling off and then being drawn back into the sun's surface. For scale, we have an object the size of the Earth here relative to one of these solar prominences or filaments. Now, one thing you could observe at least most of the time when you're looking at the sun with proper eyewear is a number of dark spots that are known as sunspots. The sunspots represent cool areas, the faculae represent bright, hot areas. So the number of sunspots and the number of faculae are going to have a direct effect on the flux of solar radiation that reaches the Earth. The solar radiation that's emitted from the sun, reaching the Earth, and ultimately warming the Earth's surface and the Earth's atmosphere. So they're going to affect climate. Here we see some examples of the sun going through its phases. Starting in early 1997, we have an image here with very little solar activity, at least at the surface. We see some ejection of plasma here on the right-hand side of the image, but for the most part, it's pretty quiet. The magnetic field, you can see the field lines, look pretty regular from the north and the south. By the time we get to mid-1998, things begin to come a little more erratic, unraveled. We see bright spots where Again, hot plasma is ejected. We see dark spots where cooler material is present at the surface, maybe sinking. The main thing to draw from this image relative to this image is this more chaotic appearance with bright spots and dark spots. But a year later, in 1999, we see the sun is really active. So there are lots of solar flares and prominences, filaments. We have bright faculae, dark sunspots. This implies a very active sun, um, very potentially dramatic increase in material ejected and also radiation ejected. An X-ray radiance diagram shows us the activity of the sun in September of 1991, a very active period in the sun's history, compared to April 1995, a fairly quiet period in the sun's history. And we can see that down here in another format by looking at the X-ray output during the sun's variability from active to inactive. That clangy here in the background is my dog. He's up to something. This is a UV image of charged iron particles. 
nothing particularly special about it other than it just really looks cool. And it shows us very clearly the hot portions of the sun's surface that are blasting into space. This is the streams of hot plasma we've been talking about and trailing back into the sun's cooler surface here, the darker areas. So again, light means plasma is being ejected towards or above the surface and the darker colors represent cooling sinking areas for the most part. Now there's a way you can take a look at this yourself. In this case, loaded up the Jeep and headed to Idaho, a place called Smith's Ferry in August of 2017 for the total eclipse. And I went to Smith's Ferry because I thought no one's ever heard of Smith's Ferry and no one will be there. Apparently thousands of other people thought the same thing and it was quite a circus down low. So we drove up into the mountains, got away from the crowd, Safety first, put on our eyewear. These are fairly inexpensive, as in a couple dollars a pair. And they can be used anytime to look directly at the sun safely. As the eclipse begins, the sun is further reduced here as the moon, the moon's disk here is transitioning the sun's surface. And we're getting close to totality here which you can see just about to happen in this lower image here. This is known as the Bailey's Beads effect, and it's generated by sunlight passing through lowlands in the lunar surface here. This would be a highland of some type, either a series of hills or mountains, the edge of a crater perhaps, or that's blocking the sun's radiation. Here we have another lowland that allows light to pass through. Another highland here, blocking the light, lowland, highland, lowland, highland, and so on. So again, Bailey's beads effect. Give us an idea of the topography of the moon. During totality, I took this image in Idaho. A friend of mine was watching the eclipse in Kentucky. He has a refrigerator-sized telescope that he set up in some Walmart parking lot in Kentucky, which is something you do down there, I guess. At least, at first, it seemed ironic that his image looked a lot like mine. Better, but pretty similar. These details, like the solar prominences here, the filaments and flares, showed up in my image and in what looks like an identical image that he took from the other side of North America. But when you consider they were taken only a few minutes apart, it makes perfect sense. So what uh, I saw, you also saw on the other side of North America. Now here are a couple other phenomena. This is during totality, and you can see that the, the moon is the perfect size and the perfect distance to block the solar disk, allowing us to watch the behavior of the corona with the naked eye. So you can take your glasses off during this period of time. And at this particular eclipse, the totality lasted, I think, two minutes and 41 seconds or so. So that's a good long period. Uh, you have enough time to take a bunch of photos and, and uh, look around, get a feel for what it's like in a total eclipse, which is kind of a neat experience. Shortly after, the sun begins to reappear as the moon transitions across the solar disk, and you get what's called the diamond ring effect. So at this point, you can't look at the sun with naked eye anymore. As soon as the sun appears, the very first glimpse of the actual solar disk, it becomes too bright to see anything really other than a bright light. This is a compilation from NASA showing the full eclipse in kind of a neat way. So the very beginning of transition here and increasing transition until the solar disk is blocked entirely and then coming out of totality here trending off to the right. So this whole process uh, takes about an hour or so. Now for our purposes, one of the important aspects of the Earth relative to the Sun is the shape of the Earth. The Earth isn't a flat disk in space, it's a sphere. And to make things more complicated, it's a rotating sphere. So we'll start out here on the left and we'll look at incoming beams of radiation, insulation coming from the Sun. This area here is going to be the same at the surface as a cross-section of this incoming radiation here. The difference is 
here at the surface, it's perpendicular to the incoming radiation, whereas at the high latitudes, either the North Pole or down here, the South Pole, this area is much larger. It's the same amount of insulation, but it's spread out over a much larger area. This means for a given land portion up here relative to here, we're receiving a lot less radiation. This is why it's cooler generally at the higher latitudes than it is at the low latitudes. It's also why if you're fairly light skin, you get fried to a crisp here at the equator very quickly compared to maybe a couple hours of uh, non-burning time up here at the very high latitudes. This also drives our climate and weather systems. It's uneven distribution of incoming radiation that is redistributed by our atmosphere and by our ocean. So that's what's driving the meteorology of the Earth. So mathematically, how do we approach the amount of insulation received by the Earth? We can turn to this diagram here on the right, where we have a non-rotating disk in space with an area of pi r squared. The sun is emitting radiation in all directions, but the radiation emitted in this direction amounts to 1,368 watts per square meter. Again, this is for a non-rotating disk with this surface area. The average radiation at the surface comes out to be 1,368 watts per square meter. That makes sense. It's a flat disk of this size in space receiving insulation perpendicular to its surface. Now we're going to complicate things and make it more realistic by converting this flat disk to a sphere. So now we have a much greater surface area. In this case, the surface area of a rotating sphere is 4 pi r squared. The average radiation at the surface is going to be diminished because of this increase in surface area. Again, it's the same amount of insulation, but it's hitting a larger surface area such that the Earth on average receives 342 watts per meter squared. The rotation of the Earth, coupled with the tilt of the Earth, Earth's axis relative to the Sun, is going to further complicate atmospheric and oceanic circulation, as we'll see soon. Now, this could be put in another way. Here we have a pretty similar diagram with direct sunlight striking the Earth perpendicularly near the equator with a more oblique strike higher and higher in latitude such that when we get up here again to the North Pole, the area that is struck by this incoming radiation, this insulation, is much greater. So it's concentrated at the equator, about 2.5 times the energy that strikes a square meter at the equator strikes a square meter near the poles. This is why the sun feels much hotter at the equator because you're receiving much more radiation per given area, which in this case would be the top of your head. Maybe. We can look at it a slightly different way. Here we have a source of radiation, an old incandescent light bulb, that is sending radiation off to the right. This radiation is going to be perpendicular to this particular surface. And this surface has a unit area removed. We'll say it's Again, a meter squared. Wow, you have a pretty big hand. Uh, centimeter squared. So the centimeter squared space is going to allow a particular amount of insulation through. That's going to be the flux, the amount of radiation that passes through here any given second will be the flux. If we take this same piece of paper or cardboard and tilt it, the cardboard's the same size. The opening is still one centimeter squared but we're angling it relative to the incoming radiation. It's not perpendicular as it is here. It's at an angle. This means flux, the amount of radiation passing through this area is going to be reduced, again, because of the orientation. So just a little closer here, perpendicular, allows a specific amount of light through this unit area. When we tilt that, the same insulation is going to be making it this distance into space, but the orientation of this opening has changed, so the amount of insulation passing through that opening is going to be reduced. 
how might this influence your lifestyle? If you're, say, an off-the-gridder or someone that relies on solar panels as a, a power supplement. Turns out that you need to angle the solar panels to a specific tilt if you want the maximum power generation from a particular solar panel. So here we have an array of solar panels. They're tilted to a number of different positions. You can see here at the top, we have a solar panel that's at a 90 degree angle relative to insulation. So insulation is going to be coming from this direction. The solar panel is facing this direction, so 90 degree angle. Subsequently, we have decreasing tilt until we get down to the lowest example here, 14 degrees. So what does this mean to us if, say, you have a solar array in your yard or on your roof? Well, you need to pick the most perpendicular possible orientation for that solar panel to generate the most possible electricity. There's a video here from Skyfire Solar. It's not all that good of a video, but it's a video. Um, I don't work for them. I receive no compensation. It's just something I found. So take a look at this when you get a chance. Uh, according to this video, the optimal orientation and tilt angle at Calgary, Alberta is south at a 51 degree tilt. Edmonton, Alberta, a little further to the north, has an optimal orientation for the solar panel, also south, but at a 53 degree tilt by my calculation. It's a little bit different from what you see in the video. And that's only going to be most effective for one day of the year. Think about that a little bit. Now, what are the proper compass orientations and angles for Salt Lake City, Utah and Key West, Florida? Why would that be the case? And I'll put the answers at the end of this section of lectures. This brings us to the inverse square law, the relationship of your distance from a source. The farther you are from a source of energy, the lower the flux. It's essentially spread out over a greater surface area of a sphere, in this case the inside surface area of a sphere. So we have two locations or two distances here, radius sub O, R sub O is going to be here, and R is going to be from here to here. So the insulation is going to be represented by S sub O and S. So again, um, smaller radius here, larger radius here. It can be described by this equation. S is equal to the insulation received S sub O relative to the difference in radius between here and here with that relationship squared. What does this mean? So S represents the solar flux at some distance R from the source and S sub O represents the flux at some reference distance R sub O. If you double the distance, the intensity of the radiation decreases by a factor of one half squared. And that's going to be a lot less radiation by doubling the distance. Which brings us to another phenomenon. The freezing and boiling points of water were used to establish a temperature scale. Temperature is a measure of the internal heat energy of a substance. Now it's important to know that. Temperature is a measure of the internal heat energy of a substance. It's not the same as heat. Absolute temperature is temperature on the Kelvin scale that represents the heat energy of a substance relative to its energy at absolute zero. So the Kelvin scale, the units are Kelvins, they're not degrees Kelvin. On other temperature scales like Fahrenheit and Celsius, the unit is a degree. So here we have three scales. The Fahrenheit scale, developed by a German scientist, about the same time the Celsius scale was developed. Uh, Fahrenheit chose 32 as the freezing point of water, 212 degrees as the boiling point of water, and this is at sea level, and it's fresh water. Celsius, and a little more intuitive, 
shows zero as the freezing point of water and 100 as the boiling point of water, again, at sea level for fresh water. A couple positives here that the units are divided by 100. Water is a common substance and the freezing and boiling of the water is easily observed. So you can get an accurate thermometer using just water. Now we can do that as well with Fahrenheit, but again, it's offset by some weird numbers. It's 32 above zero is the freezing point, 212 above zero, the boiling point. Kelvin, the absolute scale, again, there are no degrees here, they're just the Kelvins, is represented by the same unit difference between Kelvins as degrees Celsius, but it starts at absolute zero, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius. The boiling point of water in Kelvins is 373.15 Kelvins relative to 100 degrees Celsius.